Now then, he's ITV's political editor who's spent the past 18 months putting Boris Johnson and his fellow MPs through their paces. But during the last year, Robert Peston has even found time to write a book. His debut novel, The Whistleblower, is out now and he's joining us now. So you, I mean, you've written books before, but this is your first sort of step into fiction. It is. And it was a combination of unbelievably scary and such fun because to do something where you can broadly write what you like. Yeah. Uh, just felt very liberating. Um, uh, uh, but it is also scary because inevitably you put much more of yourself, you know, either consciously or unconsciously into fiction. And so actually more than the non-fiction books I've written, I really care if the people might like it. Yeah, so oh, really. the stress has been the stress of waiting for it to be out and then getting reaction has been quite How big. How yeah, much yeah. of you is in this? A scoop hungry journalist who suffers from OCD, <laughs> suffered a turbulent childhood with difficult parents and often sneered at by anti Semites. He's addicted to cocaine and drinks very heavily. Okay, let's stop now. That bit is not <laughs> it's not me. But anyway, keep going. The yes. book is set in nineteen ninety seven when this is when you were political editor of the Financial Times and the protagonist in our book, Gil, mm. who is a politics editor for the Financial Chronicle. So, look, it, it, there is uh, bits of me in that central character, uh, sort of anti-hero Gil Peck. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I personally prefer books where the central character is flawed, and he's definitely flawed. And the bits that are like me are he's very obsessive, I'm very <laughs> obsessive in you... pursuit of, you know, pursuit, pursuit of a of story. A story. Uh, and I did suffer when I was young, really, really quite bad obsessive compulsive disorder. I have sort of strategies for managing it mm. uh, now. Um, and actually, one of the reasons I wrote about it was because also I am a great believer that, you know, mental health things are things you should be prepared to talk about in public yeah. a bit and, and, and be open, open uh, about. It, actually. And actually, you know, uh, funny enough, weirdly, um, I was uh, with somebody uh, at a do the other day um, who came up to me and apologised for saying something anti-Semitic to me 25 years ago. Really? really? He said he'd been weighing on his mind for years. And he came up and he gave me a hug and he said he was really... So, uh, so this sort of casual anti-Semitism that, 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 that has been around is also you know, part of my experience. Why did it take 25 years to apologise? I, really, I don't really know. Um, what was sort of sad is I... Because there was a lot of it around, actually, uh, I'd sort of forgotten. Mm. Um, but I was pleased... Actually, it was slightly a touching moment, weirdly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, by, 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 by the way, I mean, the main point of the book, obviously, is to thrill and entertain. Mm. And, uh, and it sort of focuses on this idea of, of power, really, and how far people will go to stay at the top, if you like. Yes. So, one of the things... You know, I've been a journalist for 35 years. One of the things, if you do my kind of job, uh, that... Uh, you know, is, 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 has been a thing, has been I've just met lots and lots and lots of really powerful people, mm. top of business, top of politics. And some of those people are scary people. Some of them are, uh, you know, use a phrase uh, that you want to come across, have always seemed to me to be sociopaths, mm. that they're, you know, ruthlessly focused, selfish, often narcissistic, quite good at pretending that they're, they've got the public interest at heart. Oh, you, say, you, you say that they, 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 are, they are sociopaths on the verge of being psychopaths. Yeah, I, that, that, that is right. And, I mean, there have been... Cos some of them are still alive, I don't really want to name names cos I'll end up in court, but, you know, so I, shame, have I have encountered... some would be a hell of a conversation if he did. That would be a hell of a conversation. But, but, you know, I have often thought to myself, how far would this person really go to protect themselves. And therefore, in a sense, the tension in the book is there are a couple of very powerful people, at the top of business, at the top of politics, who are threatened by this central character, uh, Gil Peck. Mm. And it's about, you know, essentially, how ruthless will they be, will they kill, mm. in effect, to protect them? So well, it starts, it starts with that, cos his sister works for the Treasury, he is knocked off her bike and, and killed. So the other thing I try to do also is, is I do think these sorts of books are better if there's if there's a strong sort of human story there, and um, the human element is all about he's a, he's sort of estranged from the sister who he was who sort of looked after him when he was a kid, and she dies in what he thinks is an accident, and then the question is was it really mm. an accident? And she's working for one bit of the government, and you know. Uh, the book is called the whistleblower, and it's really about 
what she was doing to uncover corruption and then what, what, what flows from that. Um, one of the similarities that you spoke about, uh, you know, that he's sort of this uh, scoop-hungry journalist, you said that in your earlier years that actually you very much were that person and that some, some things you regret slightly. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, one of the things about particularly scoop-getting journalism investigations is it's very addictive and I've got a slightly addictive personality mm. and it is true that in the 90s um, there were occasions where I forgot the distinction between work and friendship and you know uh, there were a couple of occasions where people who were my friends told me things and for some reason or other I hadn't screened out that this was mm. a private conversation and it ended up in a you know I, I, I wrote about the, these things in a newspaper and this came quite close to doing you know a lot of damage to important relationships to me and actually you know fortunately it this happened at a stage where I you know was able to learn the lessons and since then I have put in place yeah. obviously those important lines did you lose but friends? but it, but but, it, but it, I came quite close to losing some very important friendships mm. as a result of this and I'm not this is not a unique experience in my you know, my world of, of, of the world I was in then of, of scoop getting journalism. And one of the things, again, I talk about in the book is because, and we saw this obviously in the, in the awful decline of, of standards that led to the whole phone hacking mm. scandal. One of the things I also try and do in the book is look at how media organisations lost their moral compass to an extent. Mm. But the um, like journalism is definitely faster paced now. I would say, yeah. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's there's more rolling news, there's more whether it be podcasts or print or online, there's more stories to fill. But as a journalist, do you have more control because it's more immediate? Like, you can put your story out there straight away without the risk of having to wait until publication that somebody might come along and nick your story? So there are two sides of it. One is, because of the relentless pressure to get stuff out there, I would say there isn't as much investment in proper investigation as there used to be mm. in the 90s. And I ran an investigations department in the 90s, and one of the things that I was able to do, which is much harder now, is just to create the space to really immerse in something and uncover mm. wrongdoing. Um, but the other side of it is precisely just that the technology means if I get a scoop, I can just put it out, time and date stamp, on Twitter, on Facebook, and, and you own it. Mm. Back then, I mean, you'll remember this, you know, you have one opportunity a day to get a story out there and, you know, you were waiting, you know, so I worked for the Financial Times. If I had a scoop, you were terrified until it was on the streets, basically yeah. at 10 o'clock at night yeah. as it was being loaded onto trains. It feels like ancient history, doesn't it? That somebody else would also nick the story and, you know, so you never knew whether you owned a story but also until a, that one moment of the day. The, yeah. um, the, the inclusion of social media and journalism, you say you don't tend to look very much at the, the, the the comments, even though you have got a thick skin, but you can look now at online stories and think, actually, this is a whole story that's written off four tweets. So, so four people have tweeted something, and now here's a massive, great big story about some sort of outrage. That 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 now social media can write its own stories. So it is weird. I mean, we've become sort of turned in on ourselves as a result of social media in a way that I think is uh, not healthy um you know we are living one of the things i mean i'm hoping this is going to be a series of 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 books trilogy about this 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 bloke as he ages and you know i want to do a, a sort of part two around the time of the financial crisis and a part three now and one of the things that i find very dispiriting at the moment is just the amount of hate that there is out there a lot of that is on social media or it's fueled by social media and you get this sort of weird thing where people sometimes react in a in a a narrow mistaken way to what somebody like me may have said and that 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 in itself then becomes a weird story that even gets picked up by the normal media and there's no underlying reality there. It's just a story about anger and, and, and this is... Um, I don't think this is healthy. It's taking us no. away from what proper journalism, which is about, which is to hold the powerful <laughs> to account. And quite often in this world of... We saw this... The greatest exponent of this was Donald Trump. In this world of constant anger and mistrust, yeah quite bad people get away with things for yeah. quite a long time yeah. and aren't held to, to yeah. account in the way that they should be. Well, this is right up my street. You're, um, you're so, keeping uh, that one, aren't you? Well, <laughs> I, 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 I 
stole £10,000 today but had to give it back. <laughs> but what I am going to do is I am going to take this and I'm not going to give it back. This is my next book to read uh, and that's what we've been talking about. It's Robert's book. That Robert, thank and, you. And, and the deal is, if you like it, let me know. Otherwise, yes. um, I'll see well, you next I'd, time. Well, I would <laughs> say, I'll, I'll say on social media, but you won't see it. Yeah. Of course. Well, <laughs> actually, I will now make a point of only looking at your feed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.